Well, welcome everybody to Esther Arise. We are women who have taken steps of bold, courage, dauntless women in the face of trials, and we've overcome. And I'm so glad to be with you once again today. And I'm very happy to have our very special guest with us today, Donna Jones. And I can't wait for you to meet her and hear about the amazing things that she's doing. But first of all, let me just share with you a little bit about Donna. First of all, Donna, I have to say, and as I bring you on here, I was so encouraged by your church webpage. I think your byline was, and I'm kind of getting ahead of me a little bit, but loving God, loving others, and having a blast. Yep. That's our motto. Love God, love people, have a blast. Have a blast. I can't wait to hear about that. But Donna Jones is a national speaker who's spoken in 26 states and on four continents. So this woman is getting around, y'all. She's the <laughs> author of Seek, A Woman's Guide to Meeting God, Taming Your Family Zoo, and Several Bible Studies. A UCLA grad, Donna and her husband, JP, planted Crossline Church in Laguna, California, Laguna Hills specifically. And she's a sucker for strong coffee and cute shoes, a woman after my own heart. <laughs> and Donna is a mom to three wildly funny, Jesus-loving young adult kids who frequently sit on her kitchen counter just to chat. Welcome, Donna. We are so glad that you are with us today on Esther Arise. I could not be more excited to be with you. What a, what a you. great day to be together. Thank you. Well, I just, as I was reading some of the things about you, and like I said, I went on your face page and your, your website for your church, because I too am a church planter, and I wanted to hear about your story, and so it was exciting to read some of those things. And then even in your bio about um, you just love strong coffee and cute shoes and you have wild, <laughs> funny children. You sound like you're a lot of fun. Tell me a little bit about you and what's your reason for having so much joy in this life? Well, <laughs> uh, first, thank you so much for having me on. And um, yeah, my husband and I planted a church. It wasn't something that we ever... Um, anticipated doing, nor was it really ever something we wanted to do. There are some people who that's their dream, that's their vision, that's their clear call from God. Um, I was not one of those people. And so um, uh, that, which really, you know, is, is part of my story is why we're going to talk about what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but we did plan a church 15 years ago. And um, it has turned out to be the biggest blessing of my life, though it wasn't without some struggle to get there, to say, to say yes. Um, uh, as you said, you know, we have three kids and they were all a part of that. And, uh, you know, anytime we, anytime that we do something where we follow God, it not only affects us, but it affects everybody ar around us. So. Absolutely. Well, yeah. and that's what we're going to talk about today is that. When God asks you to do something, honestly, you'd rather not do, mm -hmm. it's difficult. And so that's what you're talking about. You felt very convinced and convicted in your heart and soul that God was asking you to do something you didn't want to do. How did you know that God was leading you into ministry and planting a church? And by the way, Planting a church and pastoring a church is not for the faint of heart no, to it begin isn't. with. Right? No, it is not. No, because you put everything on the line, literally everything. Yes. Um, I, I'm going to go back uh, a little bit because I, I'm going to tell you the progression of how this all came because I, I really believe this is an, a topic that every one of your listeners or viewers will have to deal with, has dealt with, is currently dealing with. And Christians don't talk about it a lot, but there is always, there's always something where God is asking you to do something. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we feel like, yay, you know, I'm, I'm really up for that. And other times, honest, if we're really honest, you know, we would say, I would rather not do that. Is could there ask someone else? Yeah. Ask, ask someone else. And it could be, it, it could be a variety of things. We're talking about ministry, uh, a ministry assignment from God. But, you know, it could be things like relational issues. I want you to forgive. 
-hmm. and you're thinking, I would just rather not do that, Lord. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. I, I need you to um, confront this, this issue that's going on that's been an elephant in the room in a relationship. And you think, I really honestly don't want to do that, God. Right. Or it might be, I need you just to shut your mouth and you know, pray about this and watch me work, but I need you to step back. And we think, well, are you kidding me, Lord? That's not what I want to honestly do. I want to say something. You know, so it can be a physical thing uh, where we have to handle a chronic illness or a loved one's chronic illness, a disabled child, an aging parent. Uh, you know, there, this, this topic, it, it affects our emotional world, our spiritual world, our physical world, our social world. There, it, it, it all, it, it, it's all encompassing with who we are. So um, everybody who's listening or watching is going to be able to relate to this. To relate. In my own story, when J JP and I, that's my husband, we met when I was a student at UCLA. He was on staff with Crew, which was called Campus Crusade for Christ back in the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I fell in love with this man who was in the ministry. Now, I didn't go to UCLA to be in the ministry. I wasn't opposed to it. I was a believer. But to me, Christian ministry was a great thing for other people, <laughs> right. just not for me. Yeah, Didn't right. ever even think of it. But I fell in love with this man, and he was headed toward ministry, which meant that my life needed to align with that. Mm -hmm. And that was, quite honestly, a very difficult decision for me because that meant leaving one trajectory of my life mm -hmm. and then following a new trajectory that I had never even considered before. Mm -hmm. So, um, you, you know, it, it, it didn't come easily. Um, obviously, it's the best thing I ever did, but uh, it was a struggle. Um, we moved to Santa Barbara, California, because we're, we're um, from California. Okay. We started a ministry, the, the crew ministry, the Campus Crusade ministry at UC Santa Barbara with no contacts. So we just moved up there and started this ministry. Just here we are. Yeah, here we are. And, you know, here's this girl who I didn't even know if I wanted to be in the ministry. And mm -hmm. you would think God would say, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna just, since I already know this was really hard for you to do what I've asked you to do, I'm going to give you this really cushy ministry assignment. And you're going right. to be so blessed right off the bat. And I'm going to show you I'm what it's going to go easy this. on you. Yeah. <laughs> and it totally was not that way. You know, um, you know, we had to start from the, from the baptism ground up. of fire. Yeah. We were dirt poor and mm -hmm. all my UCLA friends, they, they had these fabulous jobs and were earning these salaries and we were mi supported missionaries. And I just thought, you've got to be kidding me. Mm -hmm. Um, and one day I was driving down the road and I was listening to a radio show, much like what we're doing right now, right. Um, but it was a radio show. And they were interviewing a very well-known pastor's wife. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting. I want to, you know, I'd like to hear kind of what she has to say. And then I remember the interviewer asked her this question. Tell me, what's it like to be in ministry? Mm -hmm. And she, without hesitation, said, oh, I love it. I cannot imagine life any other way. And I, as I'm driving down the road with my hands on the wheel, mm -hmm. I looked straight at the radio and I said out loud, well, I don't, I hate it. <laughs> what a great <laughs> moment for you though, to really actually be able to verbalize what you were feeling and thinking. Yeah. And, yeah. and to get honest with God, because you know, a moment ago when you were talking about giving things up or relinquishing our will. Didn't Jesus do that in the garden of Gethsemane? Didn't yes. he say, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And we think that was a huge, a massive assignment, obviously, that Jesus had. But you're talking about moments of dying to yourself throughout your lifetime, small steps of obedience where your will in his crosses mm -hmm. And whenever that happens, that intersection of his will and your will, somebody's got to relinquish. And so you said you did. And so in that moment, you're driving down the road and you say, I hate this. I don't like this. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. And, and that's so interesting that you said that because, Dawn, 
that was the next thing that I heard from the Lord. So I'm, you know, I'm driving, I verbalized that outside, out, you know, out loud. And to be honest with you, it, it actually shocked me to hear my own voice say that. Right. Because, you know, I, I was trying to be this good Christian and I was trying to be obedient and I want to do, you know, my heart, I, I love Jesus so much. I wanted to do the right thing, mm -hmm. but it was hard. Yes. And just the simple admission of that. So healing. Was convicting and freeing at the same time. Yeah, because I bet, you know, for you wanting to be a good Christian, you were probably more authentic in that moment. 100%. Just opening up your life and saying, okay, God, you got me. Yeah. You let me hear that radio show for a reason so that I'd come clean, yeah. not only just to you because you already know it, but to me so I could have some self-discovery. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I, so, so I, the, the minute I said that, I just, I heard just the sweet, gentle, kind whisper of the Lord. And he just said, I know you do. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? And it was so comforting because I, I just realized he really does know, he really does see that this is hard for me. Mm -hmm. And he's asked me to do something that I wouldn't have chosen on my own. Um, but he also put in front of me, okay, now how are you going to move forward? What are you going to do about this? And I knew, well, I'm not going to leave my husband and leave the ministry. I mean, that's not an option. So I guess I'll just have to trust you, Lord, one day at a time and walk through yeah. this. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. Now, interestingly, you know, I fast forward all these years later and if you were to ask me, tell me about being in ministry, tell me about being a pastor's wife, I would say, I love it. I love I, it. I, this is what I was, being in the ministry, I didn't know it was what I was born for. Mm, that's so so it, good. It, it was in the submission and in the surrender and in the just trusting one day at a time, at a time even though it was hard, that I ended up, you know, finding the joy in, in, um, in it all. And isn't that the way it goes? Like we are praying, you know, God grant me the desires of my heart. And we might think that we know what they are, Yes. but God knows truly because he formed us in our mother's womb and he deposited in us those things that he wanted to do with our lives that someday we would have that aha wake up moment and discover what it is that he really created us to do. So he put that bend in you. And, and he called you to ministry and you discovered that. When was the first moment? Was it a, was it a, a moment in time where you went, you know what? I was made for this. Or was it just a slow revelation, growing understanding for you? How yeah, did that go? That's such a good question. I think it's a little of both, to be honest with you. I think it's a slow growth, but I think that the Lord does give us moments where we get glimpses of um, j just glimpses of his smile, glimpses of our own feelings of, oh, I was made for this. This is where I'm used. This is, it, it, it helps other people. It brings me great joy. It brings God glory. And when all of those three, the three things are aligned, then you just know you're in your wheelhouse. Yes. Um, so I, I think it's, I think it's all three. I think it's both. Yeah. Both I often say that. And over time, you know, we live in a both and world and two things can be true. You know, at the same time, I'm still having revelation and aha moments about what God has created me to do. And I think it changes for every season of our life and we begin to grow and the ultimate plan of God is still unfolding for us. But what do you think is the common response? Maybe what are some of the things that you did or what do you think some women do when they feel, I mean, like, like Moses said, could you choose someone else? Like not me, you know, I'm not gifted. I'm not good. What are some things that you did or that you think women do when they are feeling God asking them to do something that's difficult? Yes. Well, you brought up a good one, Moses. I mean, and, and the interesting thing is, Don, is the Bible is filled with characters <laughs> Who, this was their exact story. God yeah. asked them to do something they didn't, they didn't want, to, want do. to do it. That's right. And, um, you know, I mean, God's ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than our, our ways. But Moses, you know, said, pick someone else. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Jonah flat out disobeyed God and ran the other way. Um, Eve said, I think I know better than you. And so I'm going to completely disobey you. Mm -hmm. Gideon hemmed and hawed and yeah. said, okay, give me a fleece. Give me another fleece. It surely oh, can't yeah. be me. My family is the least. Um, you know, he kind of procrastinated. He did. Stop there just for a moment, because that's such a great um, yeah. example. Gideon, because he really began to give God his resume, didn't he, of what he didn't have. Yes. I'm not enough. I'm the weakest in my family, in my clan. We're small. I'm inadequate. Do you think unworthiness stops women from answering the call of God, whatever it is in their life? Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Yes. I, I, I think it is unworthiness. Um, I, insecurity. Yes. Insecurity, fear. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, in fact, one of the things, let me, let me talk about Gideon real quick. Yes. And then I want to give you an illustration how that this has happened in my own life. This is so funny that you just said the insecurity, Don, about Gideon, because just yesterday I was thinking about Gideon completely unrelated to our discussion here, but I was thinking about his story and he uh, was hemming and hawing, procrastinating, mm -hmm. yeah. because I really do think delayed obedience is one of the biggest things that trips us up from actually mm. doing what God's asked us to do. Um, mm. Say more about that. Know, that is because we don't. If we're if we're if we're if we're really trying to follow Christ, most of the time we don't just out and out rebel. Mm -hmm. But it's more of, um, uh, we go around it. We just, I'm going to get to, well, it. Uh, yes, we just procrastinate and it's delayed obedience, which is really disobedience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but, but the thing that, that God said to Gideon was Gideon go in the strength that you have. And what strength? Yeah. But he did, but see the Lord knew you have some strength. Mm -hmm. So you just go in the strength that you would have, that you have by implication, God was saying, and I'll provide the strength to do the rest. And I just try to remember, Donna, just go in the strength that you have. Mm -hmm. You, you're yes. called to this assignment. Just go in the strength that you have and I'll provide, I'll provide what you don't have. You're called to this difficult um, health issue. You just go in the strength that you have. I'll provide the mm -hmm. strength that you don't have. You're, you're called to confront this issue and it seems oh, so scary to you. You just go in the strength that you have. I'll provide the strength that you don't have. Yes. I think if, if we can wrap our minds around that, it's very em empowering. And it's the way, one of the ways that God wants us to handle. Um, Powerful stuff. And you know, because I know when I, when, when the Lord may say something similar to that, I would say back, you know, God, what strength? I don't have anything. I think of Joyce Meyer when she said, do it afraid. Yes. So we think that we're supposed to have this sense of courage and readiness. And sometimes we do. Sometimes we're eager and we're chomping at the bit for God to use us in an area. And, and we could talk about that too. But very often we feel like I'm ill-equipped. I don't even have the desire and you're asking me to do something, but very much like Peter, I think when he got out of the boat and he took that first step, the water became firm up under his feet. And we begin to walk out on something that God calls us. Like you just said, go in the strength you have. The minute you step out, do you believe that then God begins to pour his strength into you right at that moment? Oh my goodness. I absolutely do. And I do think I, I like to picture it like this. If our, if our, if our faith is like a circle, mm -hmm. then God is ever expanding our circle of faith. Mm -hmm. So if we just stay right here, we're never going to grow. Well, God's stay small. Us. Yeah. Not growing. So we, he has to take us out of our comfort zone in order for us to grow in order for us to do everything that God has called us to do and being taken out of our comfort zone is not a picnic. <laughs> it's hard and it's scary and it's uncomfortable, but it's part of the process. And it's mm -hmm. part of the process for every single person who wants to be used by God. Everybody. So true. Uh, we don't escape I, it. Um, after JP and I um, were on staff with crew, he, we moved, he became a senior pastor for the first time. And I was a young mom at the time. 
And I, again, this is so funny, I hadn't really planned on telling this story, but I was driving down the freeway again, listening to another radio show. It was your place of revelation. (laughs) Focus on the family, uh, which I didn't know that, you know, here I was a young mom listening to Focus on the Family, had no idea that in subsequent years, I would end up being a guest on Focus on the Family. But then, you know, I just had these two little babies and uh, Dr. Dobson was interviewing um, Elisa Morgan, who at that time was the president of MOPS. Well, we didn't have a MOPS anywhere in our area. I didn't, I'd never even heard of MOPS. So, but I heard the Lord just say, you start a MOPS. And I was like, well, that can't be the Lord. You know what? I mean, that's ridiculous. I don't even know. I don't even, the only thing I know about MOPS is what this woman on the radio is saying. But I could not shake that feeling. Mm-hmm. I just kept day after day, you start a mop, you start a, and I was, I would get bored all kinds of excuses. That's ridiculous. I don't know what I'm doing. I've never been to a mops. There's not a mops in this area. You know, my excuses went on and on and on. And then one morning I woke up, JP was still asleep. It was a Saturday morning. The house was quiet and I laid there in the bed and I began this internal dialogue with the Lord. And I thought to myself, you know, I haven't told a soul that I've had this thought that I should start a mops group, mothers of preschoolers group. Mm -hmm. So if I don't do anything about this, no one's even going to know. I could get away with it. And the next thing I heard was the Lord say to me, yes, but I'll know. Mm -hmm. And right then I shook JP and I woke him up and I said, wake up. Guess what? I'm going to start a MOPS. And he was like, what's a MOPS? Now, you know, MOPS International is everywhere now. Yes. Um, but I think part of doing what God wants you to do, what God's asked you to do, even when you'd rather not and you're fearful and you feel like you don't have the strength or the know-how or the knowledge, mm. is coming face-to-face with the terms that the Lord will say to us, I know I've asked you to do this. So if you don't do it, even though no one else, even though you might show up on Sunday morning, smiling, reading your Bible, praising the Lord, uh, and no one will know, I'll know. And you will know that I've asked you to do something that you didn't do. And what I didn't know then, Don, see, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know then that Years later, God was not going to just ask me to start a MOPS. He was going to ask me to start a church. Wow. And so I, I, could, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. So the Lord was saying, if you can't start this small little thing, how in the world are you going to start this monumental thing? Yes. So it's those little acts of obedience. And like you said, doing it afraid. Mm-hmm. And then the interesting thing was the minute I said yes, women came out of the woodwork to help me start That's what wonderful. God had asked mm-hmm. me to do. Mm-hmm. Right. And you know, in your step of obedience, even though it was reluctant, you got there. And yeah. in your step of obedience, then it empowered other women to find and I realized their calling on their life and having some fulfillment. So when you said yes to God, they were able to say yes to God. Yes. And, you know, I want to go back just a moment, though, because we, we talked about some reactions that women have. And sometimes we run. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we're disobedient. Yes. Sometimes we say no. We say mm-hmm. choose someone else, God. Sometimes we are delayed in our obedience as we're talking about Gideon. But you kept hearing the voice of the Lord. And so that's what you mo- was motivating you and you answered to that. Like Gideon, he wasn't sure he was hearing the voice of God, was he? What, was that part of his fleece? Like, I'm not sure this is you, God. Is it really? What would you say to women who say, I'm hearing something, but I'm not sure. That's why I'm giving God excuses or I'm delaying. Is it me? Yeah. Is it God? Did, is it last night's burrito? What? Oh, what is it? gosh, Don, that is such an amazing question. Because is there any one of us have, that has not been in that circumstance? 
Right. I mean, all of us, all of sometimes us. we know, and sometimes we like, oh, I don't know. I, I think I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I think Gideon's heart was, and you know, the Lord always knows our heart. Yes. So when he asked for those fleeces, the Lord knew if I respond to Gideon, Gideon is going to obey me versus having a kind of heart where we can ask God all day long, but we really, we're really not going to do we're what just, God wants. In fact, you know that, that passage um, in, in the book of James, James 1, where it says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously and out mm-hmm. uh, without finding fault. Oh, mm-hmm. But it says, but let him ask and don't doubt because that person is a double-minded man and stable in all his ways. Mm-hmm. It's like the winds right. of the wave, they're, they're tossed. Just, I used to think, okay, what does that mean exactly? Mm-hmm. Well, a double-minded person is the kind of person that says, Lord, I don't have wisdom about this. So would you give me wisdom? But here's what I'm going to do. You tell me what you want me to do, and then I'll decide if I'm going to do it or not. Mm, yeah. Versus I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. So you just show me what it is. Mm-hmm. See, that's a, that's a really different huge distinction. Angle. I'm asking for wisdom. So I think for those of us who are like, Lord, you just tell me what it is and I'm going to do it. I've already predetermined in my mind that I will obey what you tell me to do Mm -hmm. versus you tell me what you want me to do. And, you know, I'll kind of decide if that's something I'm, I'm up for or not. Right. And God responds to the first one and, and not to the second one. I love that scripture in James and uh, the version that I read will say lavish. And I love the word lavish because it's so lavish (laughs) and he will lavish that wisdom on us. And I think you have to trust when you're in the word of God, when it lines up with the word of God, when you're, when you maybe have submitted it even to some counsel and some wisdom, Mm -hmm. you have to trust that you are hearing the word of God. And I love what you said that God knew Gideon's heart. So if perhaps it wasn't what God was saying, Gideon's heart at that place and time was to know God's will. Yes. And when our heart is to know our father's will and to do it, what we've already determined in advance, whatever you tell me, God, I'm prepared. I'm ready. I mean, I think I know what it will require, but maybe not, but I want to do your will. I, I don't believe the Lord allows us to miss his will. He directs us and he leads us and he makes his voice very clear. And it's a promise, isn't it? That we can claim that he says in John, in the book of John, my sheep know my voice, right? So, yes. so you know, God's voice when he's talking to you, is it, is it that clarion voice, even though it might be a whisper that just kind of cuts through everything else? You're like, yeah, that was God. Yes. And I, and I think God speaks to us in, you know, in, in a variety of ways, but two primary, two primary ways through his word, of course, the word of God and through his whispers, which is mm-hmm. the internal conviction of the Holy spirit. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that JP and I were just talking about yesterday, standing in our kitchen, he had read um, an Oswald chambers devotion. Oh, so and good. I know. Isn't that so good? And um, we were talking about finding the right path to follow in your, in your life. And JP said, you know, I read this, this devotion with Oswald Chambers and Oswald Chambers challenges believers not to look for the path, but to keep their eyes on Jesus. Because if we keep our eyes on Jesus, he'll show us the path. But if we keep our eyes down looking at the path, then we might miss Jesus. <laughs> so if we just focus on Jesus, I just want to love you. I just want to follow you. Yes. I want to obey you. And we do that one step at a time. Then w- one day we'll go, I was, I was on the right path. And, and um, mm-hmm. in the book of Hebrews, it says, let us run with endurance, the race marked or run with perseverance. Some person, mm-hmm. person, versions say, I'm having a yeah. hard time getting my words out. Um, let us run with perseverance, the race, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Mm-hmm. And I love that because he says, the way that you're supposed to run your race is to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. 
but he says, run with endurance the race marked out for you. And sometimes mm -hmm. we tend to think, I'm going to run with endurance the race marked out by me. Oh, yeah. And there's oh. a difference. There's, yeah. Big difference. Because we don't mark out our race. The Lord marks out our race. It's a race he's marked out for us. And we find it when we, we, we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Yes. So many, boy, you could go so many different directions there right now. But I love the old hymn that says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So fixing our eyes on Jesus means to focus, to meditate, to dwell, and to almost create blinders, the distractions, and just keep our thoughts and our mind on his ways and his word and his whispers. And, and one way that I do that is with a journal. And, I, and, and then you talked about that race being marked out. And so often we're tempted to compare or to mm -hmm. look and to see where we are compared to others. And so, yes. so keeping our eyes on Jesus, not on our path and not on someone else's path, but just focusing on him. And that takes the discipline. That takes a place of, say, of surrender and, and faith once again. And that's, that's the message that we're talking about today. When God is asking something of us, making sure we hear his voice, knowing how to respond to him in a way that is obedient and timely. Sometimes God will ask us to do something and he, and we know it's not for right now, but we might have a season of preparation like, I know that's coming, so what are my next few steps? Mm -hmm. What would you say, as we kind of wrap up our time together on the opposite end, what about the woman or the man listening? What about the person who is all too eager to get out there and work for Jesus and, and do this and do that and do, you know, and they're just busy, 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 busy. And maybe their response is more like Peter when he jumped in the garden and pulled out his sword and said, I'll take care of it for you, Lord. And <laughs> <laughs> what about when God's like, whoa, hang on here. <laughs> Appreciate it, but step away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, I think that's why going back to really and not even to over-spiritualize this. I don't want to, I, I want to make this super practical. Practical, sure. But the most practical thing we can do is really focus on Jesus, honestly, because like you said, Peter thought he was doing the right thing. Or even think about what Jesus, you know, when Jesus was saying, hey, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to go to Jerusalem and be crucified. And Peter said, oh, not you, Lord. Mm -hmm. And Jesus had to go, get behind me, Satan. You are thinking of things like men think them yeah. that life should just be cushy and comfy right and it's not always like that so you know we have to actually be thinking is this what god wants me to do yes um and like you said i think he'll redirect us and he works on our hearts and you know he's so gracious with us he yeah. really is so he really is so gracious with us in fact just closing off one of the things i think that is the hardest thing to do is not an action that God asks us to do, like step into a ministry, mm -hmm. I think it's an attitude. Oh man. I think when the Lord says something like, I want you to forgive. Mm -hmm. I want you to release that bitterness. Yes. I want you to reach out to that person. You know, those types of things. Now that's the really hard stuff. Mm -hmm. And years ago, there was someone very close in our church that there was um, a very deep hurt. And I mean, it, I didn't see it coming and it absolutely crushed me. And I remember, and it was, just, it was flat out wrong. It was just flat out. You couldn't, you can't dice it any two ways. It was just wrong. And I remember talking to a girlfriend right after it happened. And I said, okay, I know God wants me to forgive, but I just, I can't get there right now, but I want to, I just don't know how right now. Yeah. And I will never forget what she said to me. She said, Donna, the mere fact that you want to get there 
pleases the Lord. Oh yeah. And it was like the weight of the world was off my shoulders because there are some things that we just need to stop delaying and do. There are other things that we have to process. Yes. And forgiveness is one of those things, Mm -hmm. but the, the mere willingness to say, God, you're asking me to do something that honestly I don't want to do, right? but I want to do it just because I want to be obedient to you. Mm-hmm. That in, it, in and of itself pleases the Lord. Mm-hmm. That's so powerful, Donna. And I believe that because I've been there as well. And it's different than a stubborn refusal that says, I don't want this that we are in that process. And sometimes as Christians, I think we rush in with forgiveness sometimes more quickly than we ought to, because we want to leapfrog over the pain and over the wound. And we just put a glaze on it. But you know, several years later, you might find that something's bubbling up from deep within you. And you may discover, I never processed that correctly. And I'm actually still really wounded and unforgiveness is still in there. But I gave it lip service, so I think I'm okay. So I really honor that process of forgiveness. I'm working with a young woman right now. and We've been working on getting ready to do some forgiveness for about five weeks. And next week, we're going to go there. She's, she's ready. And I, I said, I'm not going to rush you because Jesus said to forgive from the heart. I know it's an act of your will. Right. Number one, it's just obedience. But number two, we don't know how deep forgiveness is until we're willing to even name some of the wounds that we received from this person. So we really know what it is we're giving God. So we've been naming it, we've been calling it, but you know, back to the point, you're right. Those are the things that are the most difficult to say yes to Jesus about. They're the things where we're dying. It's, It's crucifying the flesh. It's walking in the spirit. It is saying no to the carnality that's within us. We're saying, not my will, but yours be done. I got to die to this, Lord. We got to pick up our cross every day and and die to things. Yeah. And you know what I love? I love, gosh, this is what I love about Jesus, that God never asks us to do something he has not already done. And so, you know, we talked about at the beginning, Dawn, how when God asks us to do something we honestly would rather not do, it can be in an emotional area, a spiritual area, a social area, a relational area, a physical area. When you think about going to the cross, that was, uh, that was a physical dying to self. That was an emotional dying to self. That was a spiritual separation from the father. That was a social uh, rejection from from men. I mean, that would, it hit on every level of the Everything. human being. Yes. And, and you, you'll notice that every other time that Jesus was asked by the father to do something, there was immediate obedience. But in this one, he processes it. Mm-hmm. Father, is there any other way this cup can pass from me? Mm-hmm. And then, but then he ends with yet not my will but your will. And I think that is such a beautiful um, template for us to go back Mm -hmm. to when we know God's asking us to do something where it's like, I I just don't want this to be in my life. I kind of hate this Mm -hmm. (laughs) to go back and say, well, Jesus despised the cross, but he did it for the joy set before him. And he gives us the template for how to handle it. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. You know, I want to just speak to the listener who is either listening to the podcast or watching this today. Maybe that's exactly where you are. Maybe you've been in that wrestling match with Jesus. Maybe you've been the one in the garden crying out and saying, no, God, no. And maybe there's another way. But you realize, and you, today you've heard it again, that surrender is the way that releasing and relinquishing your will to his. And you know, there's no greater joy that will come into your life than when you finally finish that fight, lay it down, give it to God, because you cannot outgive God. There's nothing of your life or your soul or your possessions. There's no relationship. There's no amount of money. There's no fame. There's no job. 
There's nothing that will compare to the joy that Jesus will give you and the fulfillment in your life. So Donna, it's been great to have you. What would you say in closing? Well, first of all, talk to us about where can they find you if someone wants to know more about you or get your book and a little bit about your ministry, and then we'll, I'll have you give a closing thought. Yeah. Um, I'll, first of all, thank you so much. I would love to connect um, with, with anybody who's listening or who is watching. Or me. My heart is to serve and to help. Mm -hmm. And you can find me at DonnaJones.org is my website. I'm on Instagram at Donna A. Jones as well. Um, at Facebook also, Donna Jones speaker and author. But I would love to connect with you. You can find my book, Seek, A Woman's Guide to Meeting God. Amazon, any Christian bookstore can order it for you. Um, it's, it's, you can find it everywhere. All right. So what would you say to our modern day Esthers that need to rise up because this is their moment? This Parting is the thought. moment. They were born for such a time as this. And I would say you never regret obeying God. You, you may regret disobeying God. You will regret you will. disobeying God, but you will never regret saying yes to the Lord. That's awesome. That's a great way to end. You will never regret saying yes to Jesus. I couldn't agree more. It's been wonderful to have you on, Donna. And um, you were talking about all the ways to connect. So I'm going to connect with you. Because yeah. I think you're an amazing woman. You're a gifted woman of God. You have a voice for now. You are an Esther. And I thank you so much for being with us today. We look forward to uh, talking again and meeting up sometime. You're still in California, huh? We're in sunny Southern California. Yes, we are. I'm not jealous. <laughs> We're in rainy Michigan right at the moment. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but... Well, it's great to have you. Thank you so much for being with us today. This is Don Scott Damon, your podcast host and your modern Esther saying, God bless you.